Welcome to everyone on our fourth study of St. Paul's Letter to the Galatians, which has been laying our foundation for our discussion about racism. I'm Holly Benton, Executive Director for the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative, which is a newer pan-Orthodox nonprofit formed to increase servant leadership, generosity, and social outreach by clergy and laity of all jurisdictions working together locally, regionally, and nationally. Let's open our chat windows and introduce ourselves, your name, your church, where you're from. We've had well over 100 people register attend. We come from diverse religious backgrounds, mostly in the Orthodox Church, but we are joined also by Catholics and Evangelical Christians, as well as by those who do not ascribe to a particular faith. We live in the United States and Canada, across 17 different states. We're black and white, male and female, young and old, clergy and lay, as diverse as we are, we are one in Christ Jesus. It is his word that enables us to live peaceably with one another, submitting to one another in service and love. Father Mark, will you pray that God will sit at this table, this time of study, as we open Paul's epistle to the Galatians? May Almighty God, the hope of all the ends of the earth, have mercy upon us and save us and forgive us our sins. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Father Mark Fulos is author of Torah to the Gentiles, St. Paul's Letter to the Galatians. This book has been our reading companion to our study in Galatians. If you'd like to order a copy, you can find it on Amazon.com. Father Mark pastors St. Elizabeth Church in St. Paul, Minnesota, a place where we've witnessed racial tension and violence against our brothers. Father Mark and Dr. Richard Benton co-host the Bible as Literature podcast, which provides an in-depth study on many biblical texts. You can find it on Ephesus School. Org. This is our diverse and committed team of teachers of the Bible who've pulled together for this important study and discussion, Orthodox Conversations on Racism. They're all with us today, Deacon Anthony Gerald, a deacon at St. Elizabeth OCA Parish here in St. Paul, Minnesota, initiated our study introducing what the Apostle Paul means by calling himself a slave of Christ. Andrea Bacchus, a nurse practitioner and member of St. Sophia Orthodox Church in Los Angeles, took us through Galatians 2 and its implications for submitting to the one authority we find in the Apostle's message. Officer Andy J., an investigator who serves the Twin Cities Metro, led our discussion last week, drawing on the theme in Galatians that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free. He suggested that there is neither cop nor criminal under Christ. Deacon Henok Elias will lead our study today on chapter four. Bethany Saros, a homeschooling mom and author of a brand new book, A Light in the Darkness, Bible Study for Children and Teens, will present Galatians 5. Deacon Elias Dorham of the Holy Transfiguration Melkite Church in, in Virginia will wrap up our series at the end of the month. Each one has been presenting one of the six chapters of Galatians this week, and as much as possible, participating in the discussions that follow the Bible study. If you'd like to donate to this series to offer them an honorarium or otherwise support the program and mission of the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative, you may do so at orthodoxservantleaders.com. I've asked our presenters to lean in a little more to the struggle of racism and share more about their own experiences and backgrounds, since we have such a diverse team of teachers. And let me introduce Deacon Henak Elias, who serves the Vir Virgin Mary Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Los Angeles. As a child of Ethiopian descent living in LA, his formative years were shaped in the midst of the LA riots following police brutality against Rodney King. He has an education in mediation and is currently employed as a teacher. He works diligently to produce the weekly Tawahedo Bible Study podcast that you can find on EphesusSchool.org. He places his hope in the teaching of St. Paul and the practice of table fellowship or kinania. When I first engaged Deacon Henock on this project, he quickly volunteered to take on Galatians 4. So I'm really looking forward to the study. Deacon Henock. Thank you so much, Holly. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. But I want to begin first, actually, with a, a secular quote that is spread a lot on the internet from Antoine de saint Exupéry. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. So today we are discussing racism and Galatians. I'll give you a brief roadmap. I wanna first talk about and lean into the idea of racism and 
whatever my personal identity is, like Holly invited me to do. And then I want to go backwards a bit and actually re-emphasize something I said during the Q&A when Officer Andy was teaching last week. And then I want to get into the actual assignment of today, which is Galatians 4. So first, the reason I, I read that quote is because it would have been easy you know, for the Bible to be summed in the two things that Jesus said, right? Love God, love your neighbor. It could have been two bullet points. Instead, we get this incredible magnum opus of really humanity that is one of the lengthiest texts, certainly the most produced, most sold text of all time. And there are so many versions, but as we study Galatians or any text within, we have to realize that the original language is are Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, and we need to try our best to study those. Recently on their podcast, Father Mark Boulos and Dr. Richard Benton mentioned that if you can't do that, and you're going to be having a Bible study in English, the best you can do is at least listen to multiple versions. So I'm going to invite you to, to see what I do for the Bible study I normally lead on Sundays with my church, and you know now it's in the virtual atmosphere. As an example, we use the King James Bible, the New King James, the RSV, the ESV, David Bentley Hart's version, N.T. Wright's version, and sometimes we'll look at the message or the Hawaiian pigeon. And so that's just to give you a kind of breadth of how many different Bibles there are. This morning, in preparation, I listened to Chance the Rapper, who projected to over 100,000 people him reading the entire text of Galatians. If you want to see someone gleefully read Galatians for the first time, I encourage you to type in Chance and Galatians in your YouTube search bar, and you too will be able to hear the word. It's important to read, but also remember that faith comes from hearing, and hearing is regarding the word of God. So as was mentioned in my bio a little bit, I was born in 1990 in Los Angeles, where there's a living memory of the Watts riots from the elders that are around us, and the kind of indignation or righteous anger that Black folks in LA were feeling at the time in the 60s. At the same time, immediately around the time when I was an infant, you have Rodney King, you have OJ Simpson, you have all of these scenarios lingering around. You have NWA on everybody's lips talking about F the police, and it was not the later film The Police as it was changed to by some other people. You know the attitudes that certain people had. I myself have been pulled over, which if I want to be self-righteous or self-aggrandizing, I will say you know, it's for unjust mm -hmm. reasons. It wasn't for any sort of blatant swerving or anything like that. In fact, the times that I've been pulled over, I, I could tell it's, um, you know, especially by the kind of opening words people had, not hello, not license and registration like you see in the movies, but how long has it been since you've been out of jail? You know, I, I've experienced things that other Black Americans who consider themselves ADOS now, actually, African descendants of slaves do, even though my family immigrated here from Ethiopia. I also have the background of that immigrant experience. In fact, I have quite a confused set of identities because to my fellow Ethiopian Americans, being the traditionalist that I am, from the garb to the focus on languages that I have, I am too Ethiopian for the Ethiopian Americans. For my parents, whatever sort of insults parents lay upon their children, the one that used to hurt me the most is that they would call me Faranj, which in Amharic means foreigner. And so to the Ethiopians from Ethiopia, I'm far too American in the way I behave because I'm so, sort of compromise or mixing of these cultures. To some of my black American friends, they would say, well, you're not quite like us, you're African. To some of my white friends, they would say, well, you're not quite like us, you're black. And so the kind of narrow niche into which I fit in amongst all of these identities was quite confused from a young age, but I'm experiencing, you know, blackness, immigrantness, child of immigrantness who's different than the immigrants, who's not quite, you know, the immigrants because he's a first generation born here. So all these different identities 
are swirling around. And when I'm working in the university setting, I used to be an organizational ombudsman. I remember taking diversity and inclusion um, trainings where we would learn about the intersectionality of our identities, right? Your height, your age, your sex, your sexuality, your economic status currently, the economic status that you grew up on, and how all of those would connect with one another. And we would be asked, what is your most salient identity? What is the identity that sticks out the most to you? And here, again, I have to give a hat tip to Father Mark Bulos's book, Torah to the Gentiles, as well as Father Paul Nadim Tarazi's a commentary on Galatians, both of which I've read and both of which have formed my thinking and helped me come to the realization that of all the identities I have, the largest identity is as a child of the Most High. And I gain that identity through Christ Jesus, who was preached to me by Paul, as we'll see when we get to the end of Galatians, with what large letters he wrote this epistle and instructed his disciples and their disciples and so on and so forth until this current generation to read them aloud in the various communities. In fact, this ecumenical effort between the Greek communion and the Afro-Asiatic communion that we're seeing today is because we find our kinonia or our table fellowship, our participation, our sharing in the scriptures which we have preserved in both of our traditions, both in the Greek language and in the Giz language, which have many links and long traditions together. So all that is enough of my identity. And now it's time to crush my identity with the text of Galatians. I'm going to cheat a little bit by going back to chapter three. And the reason I'm able to do that is because as I was discussing earlier this week with Andrea, who's on, on this session today in my podcast of the Tawahedo Bible study, the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament do not have chapters and verses. And so even us dividing it in this way is because we had to give it to you in some sort of palatable way, some way in which you can eat this. As Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll, we want you to eat the scroll, but we don't want you choke on it. So the main menu item is Galatians chapter four, but I'm gonna start you off with the appetizer of Galatians chapter three, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is, ni there is neither male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I almost stumbled again in reading this, and I made this point in the Q&A session last week, but I'm reading from the Greek Orthodox Bible from Father Laurent Plainwork right now, and even in this version and in other versions, there's this issue with the Greek. Now, I'm no Greek expert, but I'm able to look at interlinear texts to see the transliteration, which means Greek as it would be written in English, which is really the Latin script. And so when I looked at that, I saw where it said neither or nor, it said O-U. I don't know if it's pronounced U or we or however. I'm going to say U and I could be corrected later. So I saw U, U, Ude, U. And when it came to male and female, it says Kai. And so the word Kai there is different than U. And so it should be translated as and, male and female which is an invitation to go and hear Genesis one more time. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, you hear the call to bear fruit and multiply, instructed to them who were created, male and female, by the Lord. And later on, in the Acts of the Apostles, from verses 1 to 8, you see the counterfoil to the world domination and megalomania of Alexander the Great, whom we never forget, is the disciple of Aristotle, who is the disciple of Plato. Alexander the Great tried to conquer what in his time was the known world, and he was pretty successful at doing it. But greater than Alexander the Great 
are the children of the Most High, who in Acts chapter 1 through 8 have the universal preaching of the gospel, culminating in the ends of the earth, the Ethiopians, those dark-skinned folks in Africa. The gospel reaches even them. The good news reaches the farthest peoples known to the ancient world. Of course, they didn't know about the North Americans at the time. And so in that way, through Acts, chapters 1 to 8, a counterintuitive world domination happens. A domination that comes not with a physical sword, but with a spiritual sword, which is double-edged, meaning that it strikes at both the reader and the hearer. And so the call to bear fruit and multiply, as we'll see in Galatians 4, is the call to make more and more and more children of the Most High. Oftentimes we emphasize this in a biological way, but when we look at it in a spiritual way, it means we're making children of scripture, people who are going to read, read aloud, and do scripture on a daily basis until our Lord Jesus comes again to judge all those who've ever lived and to judge all those who've ever died. Now we'll get into Galatians chapter four. I hope you enjoyed the appetizer. Here's your main dish. Verses one to six. Here is my point. As long as the heir is a child, he is no different than a slave, although being the owner of everything. The heir is under tutors and trustees until the day appointed by the father. Likewise, when we too were children, we were held in bondage under the elemental principles of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, and so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So verses 1 to 6 continues this theme that we are needing to bear children. We are needing to bear fruit and to multiply. And these children of scripture are becoming heirs of God, the most high, through Christ, through what Christ has done as preached to us by the apostle Paul. We are becoming children of the most high and ourselves begetting or giving birth to more and more children. I'll give you the parable of American citizenship to relate it to the idea of being a citizen in God's kingdom. In America, you can be born a citizen. You can be, um, you know, what people pejoratively refer to as, as anchor babies. You can be here for a month and then even go away. It doesn't matter. You retain your citizenship. I have family and friends who have been like that as well. Or, you know, you can be like some people who have run for president and you can be born in Canada, but you can have an American citizen who's a parent and still you're granted the citizenship. Whichever scenario of these three we look at, the important thing is that nothing you did through your effort granted you that citizenship. It is no effort, it is no work that grants us the citizenship. It is the labor of love of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that grants us this free citizenship. Our work and our efforts and our labor come once we place our trust in what he has done for us. And it is a lifelong process of us calling out to him as Abba or Pater. Now the reason it says both Abba and Pater or Father here is because this is representative again of what's in chapter three. Remember that the chapters are arbitrary of Jew and Greek of Aramaic speaker and of Greek speaker. So the speaker of Greek and the speaker of Aramaic who are representative of all peoples, who are representative of real diversity and inclusion are together submitting as the fullness of humanity to he who made humanity in his image and in his likeness. Verses seven to 11. Now you are no longer slaves, but children. And if you are children, then you are heirs of God through Christ. In the past, as you did not know God, you were in bondage to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, 
or rather come to be known by God, why do you return to the weak and miserable primordial forces whose slaves you want to be all over again? You observe days, months, seasons, and years. I am afraid for you that I may have wasted my labor for you. This emphasis on the church calendar, the temple calendar, the synagogue calendar, the liturgical cycle is one that he's afraid for. Now, this verse is one that I think is abused by, by two kind of core ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have Anabaptist leading folks who want to totally toss the church calendar and say that it has no use. On the other end, you may have the hyperdox who are perhaps worshiping the calendar and who would make the Apostle Paul very, very upset right here if he was with us in the flesh. I think the kind of third way that we can do is acknowledge and use the church calendar while focusing and never supplanting the love of God and the love of the weaker neighbor. So as we celebrate our fasting and feasting periods, because Jesus never came and abolished those, you see him participating in the life of the feasts of the synagogue of his time and the temple of his time. So as we celebrate the liturgical cycle, the church calendar, without putting it down, we emphasize the love of God and the love of the weaker or the needy neighbor. Dr. Richard Benton is working on his book right now on the book of the 12, specifically on Hosea from the scroll of the 12. And in Hosea, we learn that there is a dichotomy between the cultic worship or the church calendar, the liturgical cycle, which was similar with a lot of the Canaanite regions of uh, religions and, and within the regions of the time, every city having its own deity and its own basically dialect of a religion that were similar, between sacrifice and mercy. And what the Lord Jesus tells us is to emphasize, as he teaches us from the scroll of the 12, to emphasize mercy over sacrifice. And that mercy is that almsgiving, is that remembering of the poor, remembering of the needy. The very thing that the Apostle Paul says here in Galatians, that he would like to do most when requested by the Apostle Peter. So we need to keep multiplying mercy. Observe the church calendar, but observe it with mercy. Because if we observe it without mercy, then we have made the calendar itself our God rather than the living God of scripture who instructs us to always look after the needy. Verses 12 to 20. I beg you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have never treated me wrongly, but you know that it was an illness that first gave me an opportunity to preach the good news to you. Even though my condition was a trial for you, you did not despise nor reject me. Instead, you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What has happened to the blessing you enjoyed? Indeed, I bear witness to you that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And now have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people pursue you, but not for good. No, they desire to cut you off from us so that you might eagerly seek after them. But it is always good to be zealous in a good cause, not only when I am present with you, my little children, I am again in labor over you until Christ is formed in you. I wish that I could be with you in person now to change my tone because I am confused about you. It's very graphic and cinematic imagery. He's saying they would have plucked their eyes out on his behalf. That's how much they trusted him. They were so loyal to him that they would have plucked their very eyes out. And now they're opposing him for people who are not trying to get them to focus on the needy and the poor and the weaker neighbor, but who are instead trying to shift the focus of their eyeballs to them. This is the very same issue we find in Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. They want to put their name in the heavens to replace Hashem, 
the name who is God. The tone he is concerned about here is because the medium of communication matters. Here we are in a video chat with one another, which is superior to a phone call, which is superior to a text message, which is superior to an email, which is superior to a scroll. There's nothing like face-to-face -face communication. And if all that mattered was the salvation of the original hearers, then it would have been best to just have this conversation face-to-face. -face. And yet, this conversation he had was committed to the written word so that it could be recited and read aloud for generations and generations, so that we too could be instructed by it. And so while at the time, it may not have been the most superior form of communication just for that group, for us, it is very important that we get to hear these words 2,000 years later and try to do them as best as we can. The illness here is very funny. We might not understand it. This is where the kind of contextual knowledge is very helpful. Illness in ancient societies, and for that matter, if you go to Ethiopia today, some of these people still believe this way. Illness is viewed as a curse by God. Even today, we have prosperity preachers and preachers in the United States who will tell you, give me all your money and you'll get all the blessings. Don't block your blessings. Give me that money. So the same kind of idea that a curse is a lack of favor of God. The same idea that's in the scroll of Job, if you go read the 42 chapters of Job, is present there. And so even though the society at large in that context mostly believed that illnesses were curses from God or from the gods, these Galatians received Paul in his illness, in his sickness, in his feebleness, because of the strength of his words, because of the strength of the Evangelion, the strength of the good news which he was preaching to them, which was liberatory from the old gods and enslaving towards being a child of the Most High so that they could love people properly in every time and in every place. And now that hospitability that they originally showed him is bunk because they've abandoned it. And now they're no longer being hospitable to the people that they need to be hospitable towards. They've oscillated. We can use that great Father Paul term. They've tergiversated. They've gone back and forth. They failed to be consistent and loyal and faithful. They've strayed from the path. To use the language of the gospel according to Matthew, They've strained out a gnat, and they've swallowed a camel. Might have been better for them to swallow the gnat than to swallow the camel. As we saw from Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, especially in chapter 9, zeal is something that can be used. They had great zeal for him, and then they had a 180 turn. The zeal was used for the circumcision party. And so his hope with Galatians is to swing them back another 180 degrees so that they can continue zealously for the Lord, zealously for the needy neighbor forever and ever. Now, some of the women in the audience may be mad at the Apostle Paul for using this childbearing analogy because he says he's feeling birthing pains. He might say, what does the Apostle Paul know about birthing pains? He might not know the specifics because he hasn't literally and biologically given birth to somebody. But he's seen the anguish from those people, and he's using it as an illustrative example or a parable to say, this is how much pain I am feeling by the fact that you did a 180 turn. And I wish with all of my being, with all of my thoughts, with all of my words, and with all of my deeds as I'm writing to you, that you would come back and face the Lord and go back to walking in the way that I showed you how to walk. Verses 21 to 26. Tell me, since you desire to be under the law, why do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondmaid and one by the free woman. However, the son of the bondmaid was born according to the flesh, 
but the son by the free woman was born through a promise. These things contain an allegory which represents two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children to slavery, and that is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and it corresponds to the Jerusalem that exists now in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and the mother of us all. The unnamed free woman here is Sarah, who's also mentioned in the scroll of Isaiah, and of course, in the scroll of the five books, or in Genesis specifically. So Sarah is representative of the Jerusalem that is above. Don't talk to me about the nation state of Israel. We're not here to argue about geography. That's why it's above, because the geography is irrelevant. This Jerusalem, of course, Jerusalem means the city of peace. And you can take that with a sense of irony, whether there is peace or not in the earthly Jerusalem. But in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem that is above, the city of peace, not made with human hands, but just made by God, the living God of scripture. We have entrance. There are no borders, no boundaries. We are not the ones deciding who is insider and outsider, who gets to eat at the table and who doesn't. Instead, all are invited to eat through the table of the Lord. And so there's no reason for the circumcision party to separate Jews and Greeks, to say we eat at this table and you eat at this table. There's no reason for them to establish boundaries that the Lord himself has not established. And so anywhere on earth where there's an instantiation of table fellowship, of people coming together around the word to form a literate community that is doing the word, there we have an instantiation of Jerusalem, of the city of peace. But again, not the earthly one, the heavenly one, not the one below, but the one that is above. And in that way, we could focus on our most salient identity. Whether we think of ourselves as oppressi or oppressor, we can recognize that all of us are children of the Most High. And on a communal level, the individuals within that literate community need to seek the ways in which they are not behaving as someone who is becoming of the title, child of the Most High. Verse 27 by itself. As it is written, rejoice, O barren woman who bears no child. Break forth and shout, you that do not travail. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. This is Paul quoting Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. There are many different issues. Those of you who stay up late at night may see some commercials, for example, for men who struggle with ED or invirility or women who struggle with infertility. I've had family and friends, um, it, it's actually very tough, confide in me about even miscarriages. And someone even told me that as high as 25%, and, and please don't check me on the statistics. I mean, for sure check the statistics, but if the statistic is wrong, it's simply what I've heard, that as high as maybe 25% of pregnancies end in miscarriages. The, these are very serious matters. People even listening today may have experienced one of these things. What Isaiah is saying and what Paul is saying when he is reteaching the teaching of Isaiah, is that while it's very human to be sad when these things occur, we can't delve into deep depression and despondency because we are people of hope. And the hope that he gives to the people dealing with this invirility and infertility or whatever other calamity may have come about is that even if there are issues with biology, remember he's unmarried, Remember, he's not like Peter and the other apostles getting married and having biological children. All of his children 
are of the non-biological variety. So he's saying, imagine through the internet, in person, whatever medium of communication you choose, whether you're a patriarch, whether you're a monk, whether you're a married priest, a deacon, choir member, or just someone who's a member of the laity, you have the chance to give birth to children of God by reading scripture to them aloud and encouraging them to do the word. When you do that, you are making yourself a better child of the Most High, increasing the likelihood you're going to do the word as it is seeping and boring into you, and also increasing that likelihood for others that you encounter. I'll read verses 28 to the end without further commentary and be done. Brethren, we are just as Isaac, children of promise, and it is now as it was then. The one who was born according to the flesh persecuted the one who was born according to the spirit. So it is even now. However, what does the scripture say? Throw out the bondmaid and her son, because the son of the bondmaid will not inherit with the son of the free woman. And so, brethren, we are not children of a bondmaid, but children of the free woman. Glory to God for all things. Thank you, Deacon Henock. Uh, thank you for interweaving the, this passage with the Old Testament, reminding us of what Paul is reteaching through Isaiah and, and the, the scriptures. Uh, Father Mark Bulos, do you have any thoughts? I do. Um, you know, a couple of things that are helpful um, in hearing Galatians generally, certainly this, this chapter, which Deacon Henock explained um, so well. The most important thing to remember as a context for all of this, again, is the Roman household. And it has relevance with respect to racism. Because as we're trying to figure out the relationship, for example, between the police officer and the protester, when we're trying to understand how to respond to the abuse of the police officer toward the downtrodden. We hear Paul talk about how we're all, in one sense, the same before God. He shows no partiality between Jew or Greek. But we can't confuse that with the question of one's station in the household. And it relates very much to this morning's text presented by Deacon Henock. Because the police officer, for example, like a Roman patrician, has a responsibility toward the household. So there's de facto an, une an unevenness with respect to power. It's an unequal power. And so more pressure then is placed on the patrician or the police officer or the teacher or the priest, whoever holds power or the manager, more pressure is placed on them and more accountability is required of them for the sake of the gospel in any situation. So it's important to remember that. It's a very important point. So that when we say, there's neither Jew nor Greek, or in the case of this morning's chapter, when we talk about the child and the slave, you have to remember on the one hand, as Deacon Henock said, that should the child be adopted, and that's the key point, that in a Roman household, again, this question of adoption is multifaceted the child was no different than a slave. And in the translations, the various translations of the New Testament, scholars struggle with this. When do we refer to a child as a child? When do we say it's a servant? When do we say it's a slave? Because you're stuck with this historical context that a child in the household, until the time of adoption, which came every March, if they were not adopted, they were a slave. 
just no different than any other slave. So there's this point. I would say, may, I would phrase it maybe differently than Deacon Hanok. I would say that there is no identity. That the conquering of Alexander the Great is the erasure of identity with the gospel, as you said, to the furthest reaches of the known world. So that Jew and Greek would have no reason not to sit down and have a cup of tea. So that the, the one who presumes they have a status that's special would realize they're no different than any other slave in the household. So that the one who has a station with a certain level of authority would remember that there's only one with authority and they are in a way more accountable to that one who holds all authority. And in this sense, because we're dealing with societal matters, Deacon Hanok, I would say that while there are certainly different modes of communication, even today when people can speak face to face, we go to great lengths to write down what is correct according to the law and incorrect, because even speaking face to face, human beings have wax in their ears <laughs> and scales in their eyes. So that would be my response. I just wanted to take the opportunity not to, uh, I mean, it was a beautiful presentation, but just to add these points, Holly, especially with respect to this question of slavery, that uh, no one has, people may have a special responsibility, but no one has any special advantage because of identity in uh, this morning's lesson. And I think that has huge implications for our discussion of racism. Again, Deacon Hanok, it's just always a, a joy to uh, study scripture with you. God bless you. Uh, we have one question that's come in. If we were supposed to be slaves like Paul, why does Paul say the son of the servant woman should be cast out? So the, the son of Hagar, we have to go back and read Genesis, but the son of Hagar is Ishmael. And there's, of course, this whole narrative now, way after the fact, of um, Islam tracing its lineage to Ishmael. But if you remember how Ishmael came about, there is this infertility and invirility that, we, you know, we don't know which side it's on exactly, but there's some issue there, like I mentioned, between Abraham and, and Sarah having this relationship. And actually, again, until very recently, even in my own family history in Ethiopia, I've heard of people you know, emulating this practice, which is in response to the invirility or infertility between this married couple, they just feel that the only way that they can continue their identity, the way that they can have progeny and a legacy and keep their memory eternal, as we say, is by having biological children. And because they're so obsessed with that idea, they'll go and be disloyal to that marriage. They'll commit infidelity by getting someone, you know, in these times there's no in vitro. So, I mean, you very have to go and fulfill the act. And you know how babies come about to, to go get a baby from someone else who is able to produce that. And so Ishmael is a child of the plotting and the scheming of Abraham and Sarah. As Father Paul Nadim Tarazi often reminds us, we can go back to Genesis 1 to 4 and see the entire scriptural story. This is the same idolatry as Adam and Eve in the garden who tried to create things with their own hands, this clothing, to hide their nakedness. They were nude before, and nudity is something you do with intention and you're carefree. And yet nakedness is something where you feel exposed, you feel unprotected, you feel insecure. And so because they felt insecure, about their situation, Adam and Eve created things with their own hands, which is just like the fleshly or earthly Jerusalem, which is just like Abraham and Sarah creating with their own hands, with their own plotting and scheming, Ishmael, whereas Isaac is the child of promise. And so we too are children of the child of promise. Jesus too does not come from the will of man or from the, the zar, the seed of man comes only from the promise of God. And so our entrance into the kingdom or to the heavenly Jerusalem that is above also comes 
from promise, not, not by our own force or our own will because of the insecurity of the situation that we're in. I think if you think about things the way um, those of us who are entitled think about things, we imagine that because we're upstanding citizens and we pay our taxes and we go to church and we uh, don't break any traffic laws, that somehow we're better off. And that is among many psychological motiv motivating factors for at, at best our ambivalence towards the treatment of the black community because somehow we think they did something wrong um, and we're deserving of not having that experience because we did something right. When Paul scandalizes your ears by throwing one away and lifting the other up, you get the scandal when you understand that Sarah's behavior is not admirable in the Old Testament. And the slave woman is not uh, someone who necessarily did something wrong and in fact may have behaved correctly. You see how the text attacks our, our sense of entitlement, the way it attacks the entitlement of the child who imagines that they are something when they are nothing before the time of adoption. We can't uh, fall into the trap of realized eschatology, meaning you imagine already the kingdom has come and you're adopted. You're not adopted yet. You're still a slave of the household. So just pushing us back towards that discussion of racism specifically, the way in which Galatians attacks identity, the way in which it attacks our sense of entitlement and privilege, the way it holds the one with power more accountable than the other, makes it very difficult for Officer Jay to do his job without falling under judgment. And this is where we need to begin as Christians if we are to bear witness to Galatians in the current social climate. We have to start to teach this by bearing witness to Paul's teaching. Another question, in discussions of racism, some focus on racist people and others focus on racist actions. How do these relate to Galatians? That's good. I thought the question was going to say institutions. That's interesting. Maybe that's my bias of my peer group. In fact, some people have wiped away the, the thoughts and the actions and focused only on the institutions. Um, but that, I guess, will be another question. So to answer this question, you know, there's always a relationship in Galatians and in every text that we see in scripture. And I consider it like a river that's flowing. And the, the river that flows is from our thoughts to our words to our deeds. If I may quote another text, for example, you see the proto-deacon and the proto-martyr Stephen in Acts chapter 7, who does this very long teaching on the Hebrew Bible. And at the end, you see the people think about killing him. And then they've become so primitive, they can't even have words. So they kind of gnash their teeth, but it's a way of which their words have become reduced to the gnashing of teeth. And then they commit the action of stoning him to death. And so I think the things that we think about affect the things that we speak about and affect the things that are our actions or the things that, that we do. And so if there are racist thoughts that are leading to racist speech, that are leading to racist deeds, then the idea is to try to replace those racist thoughts with the thoughts of God, which are in scripture. And you know, in this study, we're beating up on racism with Galatians. We could have easily just beat up on Galatians by reading Matthew 1 for six weeks in a row. Matthew 1 is devastating to racism. So, I mean, we could pick any art of scripture we want, but it's just replacing whatever influenced that racism. Because we, we know babies. You don't, you don't see a bunch of racist babies, right? People grow into that. It's a, it's a learned behavior. And so if they've learned into it, no matter how far deep you think that they've gone, 
they can turn away. And if you don't believe me, go research Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is one of my favorite people and activists. He's a black American. He's a former deacon in the Protestant tradition. And he's a musician of blues and jazz and other genres. He has personally defrocked, a great word we use in orthodoxy, he's defrocked many Ku Klux Klan members, including the head of Maryland, and he single-handedly defrocked all of the KKK in Maryland. And, and he's done it in many other places. And the way he's done it is by having constant conversations with these people. Now, he's more secular nowadays, but I would argue that whatever that early Christian deacon foundation had in him, I think really affected his kind of main goal, you know, and, and while he may not be as explicitly Christian as, as we would like him to be nowadays, I think that initial push got him to focus on, on changing the thoughts, words, and deeds of even, of even clan members. And so just not demonizing even people that we think are demons wearing flesh and trying to see that where, where they are still breathing, there is an opportunity. We see the word opportunity here in the text of Galatians 4. And so if you see someone whom you think is far gone, look at it instead as an opportunity to engage them on scripture, especially if they claim that they like scripture, because then you have a sort of common basis. I would just ask the question in response to the question, if you have no identity as a slave in the household of Jesus Christ and pertain only to him, on what basis can you set yourself above another? On what basis can you say that there's something wrong with another identity when you don't have one? Galatians is a nuclear bomb because no one comes away clean. No one comes away undamaged by it because you can't claim that any identity is of value. And that is a bitter pill that cannot be digested by Western culture, which in its promulgation of identity narratives deepens the wound of our bitter treatment of one another. So really hear what I'm saying. Identity is the sin. Identity is the issue we're tackling here. Otherwise, let's decide which culture is the best and join the colonials and get back to business oppressing one another, just like Alexander the Great. Come on. It's very important to study Galatians. Jessica, you have a question. What was the um, reference to when you said uh, zeal can be very useful? That was it. I wanted to know what was that reference? So Saul, if you remember in the Acts of the Apostles, it, it begins that chapter by saying he's still breathing murder and threats. Mm -hmm. So at, he's breathing murder and threats, which means he's been thinking about murder and threats. And so he's speaking about murder and threats and he's pursuing actions which are murder and threats. He's committing violence against the church of God. And so he's there holding the clothes as Stephen is stoned to death. He's there on the road to Damascus, notably outside of the city of earthly Jerusalem, while still in the proper city of Jerusalem or city of peace of, of God in the wilderness. And so he's in the wilderness on the road to Damascus where he's knocked off of his literal high horse by this blinding light, fasts for three days, and through a direct revelation of Jesus Christ and the help of Ananias, gets a 180 degree turn. Because he's such a zealous person, what I mean is if he was mild-manneredly violating and committing violence against the church of God, maybe he'd be mild-mannered in his Christianity if and when he converted. But instead, because he was so zealous in his pursuit of persecuting Christians, in fact, in that, in that chapter, uh, in the revelation from Jesus Christ, it says that not he is persecuting Christians. He says, you are persecuting me and my name, Hashem. And so 
because you are persecuting my name, you will be a witness of my name until the ends of the earth. And so he becomes a martyr. And even in his martyrdom, he gets shame in a heavenly sense, not an earthly sense. In the earthly sense, he gets actual pride. Because he's a Roman citizen, they don't crucify him. He wishes they crucified him. Instead, they decapitate him. And so he doesn't even get to die like other people who are non-Roman citizens, which he was wishing for. He was begging. The person who is out there committing and helping and participating, aiding and abetting the executions of Christians is now begging to be executed in the way that, that Christ is for, for the sake of, of this good news, which is inviting more people to eat at the table of the Lord. So um, what I get from that, I'm saying, I'm hearing you say that uh, the zeal with which he pursued his previous activities is the same zeal with which he pursued his actions and behaviors in his Christianity. Yes. And so what yes. I take from that is that with the uh, same zeal that uh, we discuss uh, these scriptures and these issues that we should put that same zeal to living the scriptures in our daily life and to really uh, making these um, behaviors and actions part of our life, not just part of our conversation. In the spirit of Jessica's comment, and also Deacon Hanock's words um, this morning, my prayer is that we would in fact submit to Christ as our master, and that through that submission, through that slavery, everything we do on the street would be subject to his judgment and his wisdom, and that somehow we would put off the garment of our various identities and really become homeless, become a people who have no place to lay their head, the way Deacon Hanok described his own experience as someone who is bicultural, something I identify with, that we would have no identity, that we would be strangers and foreigners in this land, so that in that situation, in obedience to the gospel, we would make the downtrodden and the stranger our brother and our sister at the table of fellowship. To God, the Father of Jesus Christ, alone be the glory and the dominion, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is in our midst through Bible study. He is and ever, and ever shall be. Shall be.